Hello, dear listener. Welcome under the fog of war. Thank you for tuning into this channel. You are listening to the second podcast of the series dedicated to Iran. Hope you will enjoy it. Before looking into etymology and names, let's try to understand who are the people that are populating Iran from the 17th century onward. For the start, it is important to note that after the last mass relocation triggered by the Treaty of Turkmenchai in 1828, there were no more major migratory movements undertaken based on ethnic principle within or from the outside of the country. In other words, since Iran ceded its Caucasian possessions to Russia, and up to this day, the ethnic composition of Iranian nation remained roughly the same. Before that, Iran was in a constant state of flux, representing a giant melting pot of nations. Eruptions of nomadic nations of 13th and 14th centuries decimated indigenous population, forcing successor states to sponsor mass resettlements to survive. Internecine strife and imperial campaigns that mark next 300 years exhausted the country and by the end of the 17th century it had no longer been able to assimilate foreign elements without upsetting that precarious balance Gajars built their power on. Thus, in relative terms, it was the time Iranian nation took forms and proportions it has now. So what was the ethnic composition of Iran at the beginning of the 18th century? Out of the estimated population of 10 million in 1700, comfortable majority or over 50% were Parsis or Farsi-speaking Iranians, descendants of ancient Aryan race. Among minor ethnic groups sharing common ancestors with Parsis but possessed of their own distinct dialects and cultures, we can list Talush people, Mazandaranis, Lars and Tats. These were but remnants of formerly budding branches of one big family that lost the race for supremacy but managed to avoid total extinction or assimilation due to isolated or inhospitable nature of their habitat. If added to Parsis, their close kinsmen, they could increase indigenous share of the population up to 65%. Absolute majority of native Iranians led sedentary lifestyle in rural districts surrounding urban centers of power, thus largely representing peasantry. Facing them in a classical Iranian pattern of dualism or struggle of opposites, were a number of Turkic-speaking nomadic tribes. Their ancestors, Oghuz people, were first introduced into the region as Gulman or slave corps of by Abbasid caliphs. Iranian dynasties that sprang up on the ruins of the Third Caliphate to bolster their armies started inviting various Oghuz tribes to relocate en masse. Brought in as free and equal players, Turkoman pastoralists began occupying plains of Khorasan, gradually spreading over the central provinces and penetrating as far as Azerbaijan and Shirvan. Their stake in the population of Iran, at the close of the 17th century, could have been rated at 20%. As in the time of the Caliphate, prime contribution of Turkomans to the state was the supply of manpower for its armies. Because of that, most of the landowning aristocracy and ruling elite of the time could trace their lineage back to the one or the other Oghuz tribe. Two other ethnic components of Iranian nation were Kurds and Balogis, claiming 10 and 2 percent of the total respectively. Former were fierce mountaineers occupying rugged highlands of extreme northwest while latter were known as unruly nomads of the desert that lies in the southeast. Living on the opposite fringes of the realm, these two tribes have largely escaped forced conversions to Shia creed and remain Sunni. 
Thus, despite common ancestry and proximity of languages, Kurds and Baluchis stood in silent opposition to the Parsi majority, forming yet another phenomenon of dualism in Iran. The remaining 3% share could have been divided between Arabs of Khuzestan and other non-Iranian ethnic groups. Latter category would largely be made up of Armenians, Georgians, or Jews occupying their own distinct quarters in urban centers. Arabs primarily led semi-sedentary life, while Christians and Jewish communities formed nascent mercantile class of the country. So, how does the ethnical composition relate to the Iran versus Persia debate? To find the answer, let us now examine etymology of these two names. Taponym of Iran simply denotes something that belongs to Aryans. Applied to geographical area or political entity, it turns into a country name. It is as ancient as it could get. Sasanians used the title of Eran Shahr or Empire of Aryans to denote their state. Thus, largely associated with the imperial structure of the Golden Age, the name of Iran had survived dark times in legends and epic poems. Unification of the country by Safavids lay foundations for the revival of the national idea that culminated in 1935 when Reza Shah Pahlavi requested League of Nations to change the name of the country from Persia to Iran. And what about Persia? It is as ancient name as Iran is, and can be translated as the land of Parsis, the south province of Fars, the birthplace of Sasanians, derives its name from the same source. So why change? Well, Persia is a name that was coined by Greeks. If ancient Iranians wanted to name their whole country after the Parsi tribe, it would have been Parsan or Parsan Shahr and not Parsia. Suffix an along with, with its derivative stan can be found in most of the original toponyms of Iran. Translated, it means a place or a country. However, West, initially learning all it knew about the East from ancient Greek sources, later was too incredulous to think that for Iranians the name Persia was completely alien. That had not changed even after Europe had emerged out of medieval times. Establishing close commercial and political relations with the region, Europeans finally came to dominate it in every respect. With that, they learned to love and admire its culture. Thanks to invaluable work of French, German, Russian and British scientists, layers of ancient history of Iran were uncovered and preserved long before Iranians learned the science of archaeology. Yet, still, the West kept calling the country by the name that was not relevant at best. It needed a half-educated cavalryman from an obscure village in Mazandaran to explain to the whole world in 1935 that Iranians as a nation do not call themselves Persians or Parsi. This explanation may raise yet another question. If Parsis came to dominate the rest of Aryans, why haven't they bequeathed their name to the country? After all, that what Franks and Angles had done in France and England. To understand this, we should think about that fragile ethnical and political balance of opposites I have been trying to describe in this podcast. The fact is that after the fall of the Sasanians, Iran was devastated by migrations of whole nations. That turned domination of Parsis over others into nominal. It was rather built on mutual acceptance and inclusion than subjugation or submission. Upsetting that masterly built structure could lead to chaos and destruction. Thus, wild hordes of nomads were invited to sit at the table of the super-civilization as equals. Successive Iranian states had used that soft power of the culture to overcome centrifugal forces of the epic struggle of Iran against Turan. 
the biblical confrontation of Cain against Abel, shepherd against husbandman. And the name of that power was Iran and not Persia. By the way, the results were remarkable, for the savage of Turan being called Persian meant nothing, while the attraction of being called Iranian proved irresistible. After all, Turco-Mongols were not much different than Goths and Gauls, proudly calling themselves Romans or Scots and Irish, conquering the world under the British flag. Hope you have enjoyed it. Please subscribe, comment or like as you see fit. All questions, suggestions or requests for additional podcast content are welcome.